Okay. <laughs> I'd like to call this meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Uh, Tess, can we get a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Here. Dawson? Here. Gordon? Here. Maxwell? McKelvey? Here. Paul Hamas? Here. Chair Kennedy? Here. And Commissioner Maxwell is uh, absent with notice. I doubt it, but are there any statements of disqualification this evening? Seeing none. Um, Eric, you got anything you want to talk about for oral communications? All right, seeing none, we will move on to the approval of the minutes. So one minutes is moving to the next agenda. Is that correct, Tess? This August 17th. August 17th. Correct. And then we will have a vote on the all four of them all at once, whether or not you were at the meeting. We've been instructed by the city attorney to vote like as if you were there, mm -hmm. like which kind of makes sense. You're verifying that in fact you weren't there. So is that good on process? Yeah. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Yeah, I'll move them. And a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And there are no opposed. Great, well that done. Uh, nice bit of typing there, Tess. I know that's a lot of tape to listen to. Um, thank you. We'll now open the public hearing. Tonight we have one item on the agenda. That's the housing element. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from staff. Thank you, Chair Kennedy and Planning Commissioners. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development for the city. And uh, we're really pleased to present to you this evening the housing element. This represents the culmination of two plus years of work uh, from our team, as well as with uh, our consultant team, um, Kimley Horn Associates. And um, we have um, Inez on the line here representing Kimley Horn. Um, we've also worked closely with a city council subcommittee on this effort. And um, we've worked with uh, countless community members. I think we have close to 3,000 community members on our mailing list. And um, I've had multiple workshops and heard from lots of uh, housing organizations, uh, YIMBY and COPA, and done quite a bit of outreach on this um, in order to get it to you here today. And of course, I uh, have to mention that we have worked closely with the State Department of Housing and Community Development as well. Um, they have been very helpful throughout this process and responsive to us. We um, have met with them many times. Um, we are on our fifth submittal to them um, to get where we're at today and have um, one comment uh, remaining. Um, uh, and we hope that the, the current draft that we have submitted to them um, resolves that last comment. So um, this evening, we are requesting that the Planning Commission uh, makes a recommendation to the council that the council adopt the housing element. And um, we are looking forward to the discussion. We have a presentation. Um, that uh, Matt Benoit is going to pull up here and then Inez will be uh, taking the lead on that. Um, and this is going to the council on December 12th. Um, the state requires that we have a certified housing element by December 15th. So um, uh, we are uh, making it right in the nick of time. We're hopeful, like I said, that um, with the, the current the latest revisions that we have addressed the HCDs, the Housing and Community Development Department's last comment, which was looking for some additional justification with respect to our site's inventory. So with that, I will- Do you have any feeling for other jurisdictions? Are we like ahead of the pack or behind? Can you tell? Um, 
I will say that other jurisdictions, some other jurisdictions in the area, um, in, in our region, are um, taking some uh, different approaches with respect to having their council adopt the housing element um, and not necessarily having a full sign off from HCD. Um, and we have attempted to get HCD's sign off um, and are attempting to get that in advance. Um, as, as you can tell, you know, this is our fifth submittal to them. They, they had um, initially 15 pages or so of comments. Yeah, it, 15, it, it was more, and then we talked with them and that got some revisions. So the first formal uh, comment was uh, 10 or 12 pages down from their initial. So their first formal comment came after our second submittal to them. Okay. Um, and then um, it, we have whittled it down to our last was two pages, right? One, one comment, but two pages. Um, and so uh, we've done a lot of work. Um, and I expect that, um, you know, there, it, it's challenging to get through on single submittals. Um, I can say um, some of my uh, former colleagues um, in uh, other jurisdictions that had the due date um, on uh, January 31st of this year <coughs> are still working on getting their housing elements certified. And so... Um, this has been a ton of work. Um, we've we've put in a, a lot of hard work um, to to get to where we're at, and we're excited that that we're really close. You know, we're not counting chickens, um, but um, we're we're pleased to be in the position where we are, where we believe that we can um, get uh, our housing element certified on time. And Inez will talk to you uh, about some of the benefits of that um, and some of the implications of not having it uh, certified on time. So, um, cool. yeah, any other questions before we dive in? Okay. <laughs> All right. Great, Inez. I'm, I'm going to hand this over to, uh, to Inez with Kimley Horn to do our presentation here. So I'm on slide two, Inez. All right. Hi. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. yep. Thanks. All right. Well, good evening. Um, tonight, as we said, we're very pleased to present you with a final draft of this 2023 to 2031 housing elements. I'm very sad that I can't be here with you all in, in person tonight for this milestone meeting due to an injury, but I am thankful to be able to present in this capacity. So thanks for, for your flexibility, and please do let me know if, if I cut out or, or if you can't hear me all right. So with that said, we'll move on to slide number two with the agenda. So we will first kick things off tonight with some background information on the housing elements as a refresher for you all and for the public. And this will include an overview of all of the community outreach that we have conducted over um, this past almost two years, as well as major milestones hit. We'll then summarize edits that have been made to the document since you last saw it, mostly based on HCD comments on public participation, as well as staff input. And we will wrap up with some information on the proposed safety element updates and where these policy documents fall with CEQA before moving on to next steps. Is it possible? So next we... This one on? Everything's working great, uh, except that one big screen. I'm working on it. I mean, we can, I mean, I can see it up there. It just would be nice. It's harder. I don't think it's going to work. Okay, never mind. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll just sit over here and watch up here. That won't work, the mic. Go ahead. I'm on slide four, Ines. On slide four? Okay, perfect. All right, so as a reminder, the housing elements is a required chapter of the city's general plan, and it must be updated every eight years. It identifies the projected housing needs by income category, and in response establishes goals, policies, programs, and quantified objectives to address current needs and guide future growth. The housing element is the only element of the general plan to require certification 
by the Department of Housing and Community Development, or HCD, for compliance with state laws. There are a number of important benefits to having a certified housing element in a timely manner. Um, certification allows the city to access a number of state grants and alternative funding opportunities, as well as protects the city from builders' remedy projects. So if the city is not found to have a, substantial, a substantially compliant housing element by the statutory deadline of December 15th, builders' remedy projects may be submitted. And these projects must meet state requirements, such as designating at least 20% of units to low income, but all of the city's zoning and general plan standards can no longer be enforced on those projects. Given the city's 20% low income inclusionary requirement, this would mean that all proposed projects of any height or density would have to be approved. As we'll go over in the presentation, the city has been coordinating with HCD since the first draft submittal. And the last draft letter, as Lee had mentioned, um, received only one comment. Um, and once that's been addressed and found to be substantially compliant by HCD, um, we'll be on, on our way to certification. So we are right on track. Moving on to slide five. The central part of the housing element is detailing how the city can facilitate the construction of housing units at various affordability levels to the amounts prescribed in the regional housing needs allocation or arena. So for 2023 to 2031, the city was allocated a total of 3,736 units to plan for. In perspective, the city's fifth cycle arena was 747 total units. And this increase um, in housing target is the state recognizing the underproduction of units statewide um, for some time. Though Santa Cruz has been doing its part to help achieve housing production goals by producing more than double the fifth cycle arena units with over 50% of those units having below market rate affordability. The city is actually one of about 6% of all jurisdiction in the state to have met the RENA targets for all income categories. And the city is one of only 30 jurisdictions in California to receive the state's pro housing designation, which recognizes jurisdictions that have policies and programs in place to better facilitate housing for all income levels. Moving on to slide six. You'll now see on this slide the various sections that make up the housing element. It starts with the first main, the two main chapters, which are the introduction and the policy plan. The policy plan establishes the policies, the programs, and the objectives that will be implemented to help the city achieve its goals, which we'll go over in a, in a few slides. And the element is then comprised of a number of appendices starting first with a summary of all of the community engagement as it has gone into the updates and all of the public comments submitted and responded to throughout. We then have Appendix B, which relies, which reviews the fifth cycle housing element programs for accomplishments and areas of improvement. Appendix C assesses housing needs based on the city's demographics and existing housing stock. Appendix D conducts a fair housing assessment which helps to guide the affirmatively furthering fair housing or AFFH programs in the housing plan so as to plan for future housing growth equitably. Appendix E assesses all potential constraints to um, housing development, including markets, environmental, and governmental constraints. Appendix F outlines all of the housing-related resources available to Santa Cruz residents Appendix G then identifies all candidate housing sites with the ability to meet the city's RENA and lays out the exact strategies that the city will be employing to continue to facilitate housing development. And then lastly, we have um, Appendix H, which is the glossary of housing terms and acronyms. Slide seven. As you see here, the city has hosted a number of events and opportunities to gather community input and feedback throughout the entirety of the update process. This included community workshops, surveys, tabling at community events, including the Lower Ocean and Beach Flats cleanup events, 
and the Nueva Vista Community Resources Food Distribution Event. We also held meetings with stakeholders, the City Council Housing Element Subcommittee, um, Planning Commission, and City Council. And in spring 2023, the city hit its first major milestone with the release of the first public review draft for community input. And as Lee was saying earlier, there is nearly 3,000 people that have signed up for the email alerts about the housing element, and around 350 comments have been submitted and responded to by staff since April 2023. And this really goes to show the uh, broad engagement efforts that have been undertaken by the city throughout the entirety of this process. Next, slide eight. So following the first public review draft, the, submit, the city submitted the first draft to HCD for an in, initial 90-day review, um, which was then followed by two subsequent 60-day reviews. With each submittal, HCD did provide the city with preliminary technical assistance um, and mid-review resubmittals. Last month, HCD provided the city with a second official letter containing just one comment to be addressed. The city has since addressed the comments, posted the revised draft for public review, addressed a few public comments that were submitted, and then submitted the draft um, to HCD this past Tuesday, November 14th. And given tonight's hearing, the upcoming city council hearing on December 12th, and the upcoming statutory deadline on December 15th, the city has requested an expedited review from HCD. And this is dependent on the state's current workload and capacity, but our reviewers have agreed to expedite the process to the extent possible. Next, we will move on to the contents of the uh, housing elements and the revisions that we've made. If you'll take us to slide 10. So as I mentioned earlier, the policy plan chapter details the community's goals, policies, and the objectives relative to housing production, rehabilitation, protection, and assistance for all residents in Santa Cruz. The policy plan establishes seven main goals, which provide a general overview of policy priorities. None of these overall goals have changed since coordination with HCD started, but we did want to go over them um, ahead of talking about the policy changes. So to start off, we have goal one, which is to facilitate housing production that meets the present and future housing needs of Santa Cruz residents. Goal two is to provide an increase in protected supply of housing affordability to extremely low, very low, low, and moderate income households. Goal three is to provide accessible housing and supportive services that provide equal housing opportunities for special needs populations, including the unhoused and those at risk of homelessness. Goal four is to provide increased opportunities for low and moderate income residents to rent or purchase homes. Next slide. Goal five is to improve housing in neighborhoods throughout Santa Cruz and in designated target areas while protecting residents from displacement. Goal six um, is to seek to combat housing discrimination, undo historic patterns of segregation, and lift barriers that restrict access to foster a more inclusive community and help achieve racial equity and fair housing choice. Goal seven is to fulfill the city's housing needs while promoting an environmentally sustainable, compact community with clearly, clearly defined urban boundaries that take into consideration the existing and potential impacts of sea level rise and climate change, particularly on underserved communities. Slide 12, please. Over the summer and fall of 2023, nearly all policies and objectives saw edits um, and further refinements based on staff review and feedback from HDD, the subcommittee, and the public. Several entirely new policies were added, and that includes um, 1.3G on aligning development standards, 1.3H on agenda requirements for conforming projects, 2.1i on supporting development of faith-based sites, 3.1d 
updating community care licensing, licensing requirements, and 3.7C, off-peak seasonal housing coordination. Many of these were to satisfy HCD requirements, but some were added based on public feedback. Another example of policy changes based on the public feedback is the addition of extremely low-income housing as an affordability category to support um, and this was added based on public comments um, at the April 25th City Council meeting. And then another example is increasing the metric of objective 4.1A regarding tenant assistance with a goal to provide renter assistance to what was originally 50 households um, and was then increased up to 100 households based on public feedback. Slide 13. So as mentioned, most of the policy plan revisions stem from HCD direction to make policies and objectives be as concrete and as measurable as possible. In some places, this meant adding quantifiable metrics such as for policies relating to housing rehabilitation. HCD wanted specific numbers, so the city coordinated um, with code, the Code Enforcement Division to estimate the number of units in need of rehabilitation citywide. In many other places, this meant removing non-committal language such as explore or consider um, and instead providing specific commitments, timelines, and quantifiable metrics. HCD granted flexibility for some policies where it was needed, but in the end, about 100 policies were revised in some way um, over the, the summer and fall. Efficient and this this task was made possible through efficient and timely coordination with the subcommittee as well as with as city staff. HED also requested further details on policies related to affirmatively furthering fair housing, AFSH. And so in addition um, to timelines and metrics, AFSH topics, which you see um, um, bulleted on the screen, um, and geographic targets were provided for all of the objectives that HCD deemed to be directly related um, to meeting AFSH goals. And each AFSH objective states which topic areas it falls into. So one way of affirmatively furthering fair housing is to support housing development in high resource areas. High resource areas are shown to be, uh, are shown by research to be strongly associated with positive economic, educational, and health outcomes for low-income families, which are typically in areas of higher income, high-performing schools, and have fewer environmental hazards. So HCD required more information showing how these AFSH objectives had geographic targets within the city, in part to allow for more housing opportunity, particular low-income housing opportunities in these higher resource areas. And those, you can see the, the analysis relating to this in the AFSH um, appendix. Slide 14, please. So next up in our discussion are the candidate sites. Based on council direction, HCD feedback, and further staff review, Candidate sites were removed and revised, um, and some new ones were even added in since the first submittal to HCD back in May. It is a noted state uh, pro-housing designation best practice that the site's inventory include units um, over the RENA to help ensure that RENA targets can be met should some of the sites that we've identified not develop as projected. HCD specifically recommends that the site's inventory include a buffer of about 15 to 30%. And the lower income and moderate income categories, as you see here in the bottom table, our final table, um, both have a 25% buffer over the RENA target, while the above moderate has a buffer of, of, of 74%. These buffers are lower than the initial submittal, as you see in comparison to that table up above, um, but they're still on the higher end of HCD's recommended range. So 
So some of the reasons for the decrease in units had to do with removing parcels that were no longer deemed suitable um, and removing pipeline projects that had begun construction or withdrew applications. But the main two reasons um, for the changes um, to how units were counted um, it were for how units were counted in the downtown expansion area and the UCSC campus. The first draft of the housing element included the downtown expansion area as a whole planning area rather than individual properties. So given the uncertainty around the ultimate residential capacity associated with any rezonings of this area and the desire to not include any rezonings in the housing element, staff opted to take a more conservative approach and use the base densities of qualifying larger sites in this area to include in the site's inventory calculations. So this meant including exactly 572 units um, as the South of Laurel area, the renamed South of Laurel area, rather than the council supported total of 1,600 units as part of the anticipated rezoning or even the 1,047 units that represent the current base density of the whole area. Uh, staff believe that this conservative estimate and the development in, the, in this area above this number of units will play an important role in meeting the arena targets, both for the upcoming cycle and in the future. The second area of reduction for units was the UCSC campus. UCSC had two large, uh, has two large um, new housing projects that will be developed during this housing elements planning period. But the Census Bureau deems dorms and student housing to be group housing and cannot count as an individual housing unit. Housing on campus can only count towards RENA if it's available to non-students, such as faculty apartments or couples units for graduate students. So the initial version of the site's inventory included more proposed campus housing, but further review by HCD determined that some units would not be able to count um, as, as units. So the city does not want, um, the city does want more student housing units to count as part of the arena. Um, so there is a policy, um, an objective in the policy chapter, um, specifically objective 1.4C, um, for the, the city to um, communicate with HCD and state representatives to encourage the state to recognize non-traditional types of housing units for arena purposes. But that did re re reduce the number of units that we are counting um, through those two projects in the housing element. Slide 15. The site's inventory, so you, you see here on the screen the, the final um, strategy summary with all of our, our different strategies and the numbers under each income category. And these are broken into two sections. We have first the pipeline projects and the projected housing. The pipeline projects include projects that have been proposed or entitled but that have not yet been counted in a previous annual progress report on housing for HCD. And this is how RENA numbers are tracked um, with timing of building permits being the determining factors for this purpose. Projecting housing details sites throughout the city that have the potential um, to develop with housing in the coming eight years. And this includes projected ADU developments based on past permitting trends, vacant residentially zoned lands, and infill opportunities throughout different areas in the city. And as I mentioned, um, towards the bottom, you'll see that south of Laurel area, which is what has replaced the downtown expansion plan we previously had. We do need to point out that the affordability breakdown of the site's inventory is not necessarily correlated with what will get built um, or a projection of the city's housing priorities. But it's rather an output on paper based on, these assu based on assumptions. The unit count by affordability are not allowed to consider the city's inclusionary ordinance or the use of density bonuses. So while the percentage of above moderate income units is higher than the lower and moderate, the affordable units created by the above moderate developments through the inclusionary ordinance are not taken into account. 
And these affordability projections also do not directly consider 100% affordable developments that is often facilitated through the work of city staff and nonprofit partners, even though that work was successful in the fifth cycle. So for instance, during the fifth cycle, out of approximately um, 1,715 units counted towards the arena, 53% were affordable. So with the city's inclusionary ordinance and with these um, future 100% affordable projects, more affordable units are expected than what is included here in this table. This is a, a conservative assumption. All right, so next we have the safety element and CEQA portion. If we could move on to slide 17. So the housing element update process has triggered a requirement to update the city's safety elements, um, specifically to address climate adaptation and resiliency, as well as potential flood and fire hazards. The safety element update is far from being as complex as that of the housing element. Um, so it is instead um, a proposed red line um, edit on the city's existing documents. Slide 18. The housing element is exempt from further CEQA review beyond what is a common sense exemption. Um, impacts of the proposed six cycle housing element and the associated changes to the safety element um, are covered by the city's environmental impact report that was certified by city council for the 2030 general plan. And future residential development projects will be reviewed pursuant to CEQA when required um, concurred with other permitting and regulatory requirements. So next steps, if we could move to slide number 20. So as I had mentioned, um, the revised draft housing element has been submitted to HCD um, this week with red lines addressing HCD's last remaining comments. Um, HCD has until January 12th, 2024 at the very latest to return comments or a letter of compliance. But as I mentioned, staff has, required, has requested, <laughs> requested an expedited HCD review prior to um, the December 12th council hearing and the December 15th deadline. We are in communication with HCD currently um, to make sure that to the extent that they can, we get a response by, by then. When the housing element is first found in statutory compliance by HCD and then adopted by city council, the, the Santa Cruz six cycle housing element will be deemed certified. So with that on slide 21, you'll see staff recommendation is for a motion to recommend that the city council adopt the 2023 to 2031 six cycle housing elements and associated updates to the safety elements of the general plan, finding that the changes are exempt from CEQA under section 15061B3 and that the changes are covered under CEQA through a reuse of the 2030 general plan EIR. And with that, that concludes our presentation. On slide 22, you'll see Matt's contact information as well as the link to the um, housing element for anybody in the public who might look for, for some more information. Thank you. Thanks, Ness. Excellent. Thank you. The end of a long and rich process. Uh, any questions for staff from the commissioners? Was, was the... I think it's extremely low uh, income housing designation. Is that a new category or is it uh, uh, an existing one? And what are the good. what are the markers for it? Yeah, good good question. Um, so it it has been in a, like a known category for mm -hmm. some time. Mm 
what's changed is that the state has passed legislation that requires cities to now track it as part of their housing element. Okay. It's not an official uh, column yet in a mm -hmm. housing element document. Okay. If, if we received uh, extremely low income ELI units, if, if they were built somewhere, they would still fall under that lower income category okay. and, and be lumped with uh, low, very, or, you know, very low. Same uh, segment of the income brackets, though. That's what you're saying, or it's different? Correct, yeah. They, they would be part of the very low count, mm -hmm. except that we would be able to have tracked them and in our next housing element report, our annual report in April, uh, we would be able to tell HCD that there's X number of ELI units as part of this very low count. Excellent. And okay. eventually that might become its own separate category mm -hmm. as well, but right now we've only received uh, direction to, to track it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Other questions? Extremely low income, though, is defined either in our code or state code already, yes. Yes. right? Yep. What, what percent is it? It's Three. zero to 30. 30. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they mentioned that. <clears throat> This is uh, not not to quiz your memory. I'm so proud to be one of the 30 pro housing jurisdictions. Do you remember how many jurisdictions that's out of? That is out of uh, 540. Oh, you're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> county, county and cities. Okay. Uh, any other questions? It's it's actually the uh, the same percentage as there's uh, 29 current uh, cities that have. Uh, formally received the the arena uh, target have formally met the arena targets and as of April 15th Santa Cruz would have become the next one so they're probably around 30 as well so yeah around around six percent for both of those this makes me very proud and uh, I really think we should have a big parade for staff everyone who's worked on this because that's amazing right and we hear a lot of complaints is mainly what we hear. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, so at this point, I will open. The, oh, Julie, sorry. I have a question that um, has sort of a long lead in. So sorry about that. No worries. Um, and this is regarding expiring units. And I'm going to refer to charts that are on uh, D slash 54 and D slash 55. Um, so first of all, thank you for the charts. Because um, I think they illustrate how incredibly expensive it is to subsidize rents um, and also versus replacing units altogether. So what you show in some simple math is $2 million annual subsidy for subsidizing, and which comes up to a $28 million replacement cost. Right. So it's worth noting that if we just look at the, those numbers and assume that the money was available to subsidize those units for in 10 years, that rent would equal the replacement cost. It is just staggeringly expensive um, to subsidize rents um, to be affordable at very low and extremely low income ranges. Um, so that simple math exercise, what caught me about it, is that it really overlooks the real problem, um, which is that the money that is needed for that replacement cost number, um, which is what it would take to build the units, um, is tough to put together all by itself. Um, but in order for those, to be, those units to be affordable, you have to both put together a big, huge pile of money to build it, and then you also have to have long-term commitments for operating subsidy, so the monthly subsidy cost. So um, all of that is by way of saying it is really horrible to lose subsidized units. And I remember, um, <laughs> believe it or not, it seemed like such a long time when the um, SROs downtown got their 30-year restrictions. Um, and well, you might remember, but there's not a lot of us do remember, but it, it went so fast. Um, and what I'm really wondering is those restrictions are expiring right now. I'm wondering, and I know that the city doesn't have the money um, to leverage a long extension um, for for those and or a lot of tools available. And I, But I'm wondering if you are managing to find, um, you know, tools to extend those um, affordability commitments. And maybe Ms. Wolf might have her fingers a little bit deeper into those pots. Yeah, 
Yeah, welcome. Yeah. And thanks for coming, Jessica. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jessica DeWitt. I'm the housing manager here at the city. Uh, nice to be here. Um, so as far as housing preservation, we're definitely looking for funding at state, federal levels for whatever we can find. Um, we have had properties that have decided to like figure out how to refinance. So Mission Gardens is an example of, of that most recently. Um, so that's what we're mostly been trying to work with um, owners who want to try to remain affordable and how to either bridge their gaps. Um, housing authority vouchers obviously really help. Um, and with the move to work program, which I know is, is just getting going with the housing authority, um, that's another opportunity to, to try and have some flexi money to um, help bridge gaps for people who are, or, or properties who want to stay affordable. So in particular, um, ha is there anything, I know Mercy Housing is, has a, you know, a lot of reasons that they would continue with El Centro, um, but it would be a real shame to lose the Palomar. Um, and I know that they have a really high percentage of um, housing choice vouchers there. Um, but there's the bigger that gap is, the harder it is to fill. Yeah. Um, Mercy Housing is very dedicated to keeping uh, any units they have as affordable in, in the town and, you know, all over the states. Um, they have several. I mean, they're huge. But uh, Palomar is not. Um, and it's this is where there's it's tricky to... It's on a case by case basis, working with the owners of these properties to sort of see if they're not interested in maintaining affordability, would they be interested in selling? And then us trying to, you know, the the city trying to figure out if there is someone who would be willing to um, step in as that affordable uh, preservation property manager or owner. Um, so th the hard part is yes, case by case basis, and if we can find funding to. to uh, but again, move to work is a another shining example. I would I would say it's just as great as the pro housing designation. So you know we're doing a lot of a lot here in the community to try to work together uh, and pool our resources. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, really glad to hear all of that. Can I follow on with one before you sit down? Yeah. So like the mayor convened that task force to look at a housing bond. Like, is that the kind of money that would contribute to this process or is it totally separate? Um, I mean, there it could be, yeah. Uh, it depends on how the money is designated as an eligible use. Um, you know, we could look at, there's local housing trust fund money, the national housing trust fund. I mean, there's so many sources that are coming out. It's um, partially it's trying to have enough staff to go <laughs> try and pin down what can work. And again, having an owner who wants to move forward. So um, all of those together are, are pieces that we're looking at um, and trying to solve the puzzle. And do you have um, priorities or that you can share with us of the projects that you're hoping to um, retain? Um, well, Mission Gardens is the is one of the ones we just, I think it went to council last month, um, or I think it was last round, um, and that one is going to be st staying affordable. Uh, there are ones like Palomar where, um, again, it's not, it's not an owner that it has a mission to have affordable housing, so it's, um, you know, we're kind of working our way down the list. Um, Unfortunately, St. George is another one of those that is a, a hard one to crack um, on in terms of trying, the owner is, you know, not a, not a pro affordable housing as far as I understand. So I, or just not familiar with it. It's a, it's a new owner. Um, it's transferred as recently. I can talk to you more later, but, um, but uh, we are kind of exploring our, you know, our possibilities and opportunities as we, as we see there are expiring Units and especially if someone's coming to us and asking for a loan consolidation or a refi, we're then asking for extended affordability. Okay. One thing I would add, um, Jessica, your team, correct me if I'm wrong, you monitor that list of upcoming um, affordable deed restrictions uh, and um, seek to proactively address those. I, I know there have been instances where that's the case, and so I, I believe that you do that on a regular basis, and so see you nodding your head and confirming that is the case. So I just wanted to call that out to the commission's attention, that it is something that the team really takes seriously because um, you know, it's, it's an important component of um, our, our, our toolkit is, is not just the production of housing, but the preservation of affordable housing as well. And there are a lot of challenges with that. And, 
when, when we have a, a willing property owner. Um, the, there are some success stories, but um, there are some other instances where, un unfortunately, we're not able to keep those in, in deed restricted affordable uh, status. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Gordon. Um, in an effort to build more housing units, I'm wondering if you can explain how we consider the the type of units that meet those goals, meaning that what we see a lot of, you know, for affordability is much smaller units that aren't that are maybe considered affordable but don't necessarily meet some of these other kind of requirements that we see for affordability, um, like families. And so um, if you could just explain to us in the world. <laughs> yeah. Santa Cruz, that, you know. Yeah, so, so what we're looking at is, again, different funding, funding sources have different requirements. Um, part of it also is where are we trying to build that at housing, what's going, so for, give you an example, for affordable housing tax credits, um, part of it is you get scored competitively based on how close is the school, how, how, what's the walking distance to the supermarket, how close is the transit station. And so based on some criteria, it can kind of start to take you down a rabbit hole of like, okay, this would probably be a good family property versus this would probably be a better property for supportive services. Um, I will say that we're doing a ton um, based on school district, um, you know, pushing for more family housing uh, to do a lot of family housing downtown. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, a Pacific Station South is a family project, family rentals, um, goes all the way up to three bedroom units. Same with Pacific Station North, which is um, going to be starting construction here um, in February, and that's 128 uh, family apartments. Um, and then Cedar Street is also a family family apartment, um, and that's just a couple of blocks down. So uh, we definitely are doing a lot of family rentals here in the downtown um, because it's so rich with resources here, and again, scores really well for tax credits. I would I would just add that um, it, we have been seeing a lot of smaller units as part of our um, private development projects. And so when we have the opportunity to have Jessica and Bonnie and their team work on 100% affordable housing projects like those that Jessica has mentioned, that's where we do have that opportunity to get some of those larger units that the uh, at the affordable levels that the market isn't producing. Um, some on the commission will recall the Pacific Front Laurel project that's you know finishing up now. Um, you know that dedicated land to the city, and on that right now um, is the project that is what, eight months away from completion or so. Um, and um, May, May time frame, May June, yeah. Okay, we had some yeah. PG&E delays. <laughs> right. Very and soon, very soon. That's yeah. What I'm saying. That's that's one of the projects Jessica was referring to. So so we're getting land dedication, and then instead of getting fewer smaller units in the the private project, we're getting larger units. We're getting deeper levels of affordability. We're getting more units. And in that instance, we're also getting Dientes and Santa Cruz Community Health Foundation that are providing low-cost medical services to the, uh, of the, to the low-income residents that are residing there. And so, you know, there are a, a lot of wins there. Um, I think um, I mentioned that most of the, the projects that we're seeing have been small units, and I think that has been um, in part a response to the demographic change changes and trends of, of smaller households in general, not just here, but throughout the country, actually, we're, we're seeing smaller households. Um, and um, I also have started to hear some interest from developers of saying, hey, we're getting a lot of these other product types, and so maybe we should be looking at some larger units. So, you know, we'll see how that plays out. I, I think the answer is, um, in part, we need them all. Right, and so you know, if we're getting affordable units, we're happy about that. We recognize there's also a need, a real need for um, family units, and so um, it's great when Jessica's team is able to um, to 
develop those projects, and uh, we've got three of them in the works right now um, between Pacific Station South, Pacific Station North, and the uh, Library Affordable Housing Project, as well as some others like the Cedar, Cedar Center Street. project that um, was privately initiated. Thank you. Yeah, that's cool to see the church property is like as a separate category. I don't remember if that was around, you know, last round, but uh, boy, have the churches done some work for affordable housing in this town and county in the last housing cycle. Any other questions? All right, then I will open the public hearing in case anybody. Did you have a, I, I had a quick one. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. I'm is that okay? Not... Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes, please ask your question. <laughs> There's no public hearing, so there's no risk to get to it. Okay, awesome. Um, I, I just had a quick question about, um, so in the policy plan, um, it, there's 3.1 that talks about, um, I believe, let me get the right wording here, um, creating low-income, or I'm sorry, create housing for low-income families with children and persons with disabilities, and then right under that is 3.1a, um, and it's about child care opportunities um, in conjunction with affordable housing development. And that just kind of piqued my interest. Um, and I'm just curious if there's been sort of any coordination among staff about securing um, some of the grants that are available at the state level or anything that has just been um, researched in terms of securing funding to do those types of things or other types of incentives, I guess, through the city that is there anything that we offer or just, and I guess where my head's at is that, you know, as we are um, meeting these pretty lofty arena goals and there's going to be, and one of, you know, some of the objectives that we're serving are to create more housing for families and all the associated services that are going to go with that um, in terms of working families with kids. And so I know that for me, when I go around looking for childcare, a lot of them are at, you know, people's homes. And I guess as we build up a little bit more in the urban core, just creating, finding ways to create more opportunities for people to just, you know, drop their kids and, and go to work. Um, so I guess I, I got a little off track there, but um, I guess my question is, are we looking at grant opportunities and have we found any? And um, do we offer any incentives, I guess, through the city to, to do things like that? Um, in multifamily projects or affordable projects or anything like that. Yeah, thank, thank you, Commissioner. Big question, sorry. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, so th this uh, policy 3.1A, uh, this objective, uh, is in large, uh, largely related to our, uh, the, the library mixed-use affordable housing project. Uh, we have a child care impact fee with the city that goes towards this fund, and that first pot of money is going to be is going into that project to provide uh, that uh, that child care facility uh, in conjunction with that housing project. So, future future city projects as well, when this pot of money is available again, might also be able to use this. Uh, that that's one key way that the city is trying to achieve uh, this policy objective in particular. Do you have anything else to add on that? Yeah, I, I would add that. Um, you know, child care facilities oftentimes have uh, specific requirements with respect to uh, access to outdoor spaces and so forth. And so particularly as we're building some of these um, more urban projects um, with, uh, you know, ground floor commercial and residential above, there isn't always going to be that outdoor space available unless you're thinking about that from the very beginning. And that was one of the benefits of the library affordable housing project is we were looking to integrate that in from the beginning. And so um, as we proceed, as uh, Matt mentioned with our child care impact fee, um, we may have opportunities to help incentivize um, future projects to incorporate um, a child care facility. And in, in fact, um, after we dedicate the first batch of funds to the affordable uh, housing library project, um, the next step is to do a child care needs assessment. And so that needs assessment will help inform how we want to spend the money that we're getting from that uh, child care impact fee. 
moving forward. And that can also identify that there are certain levels of demand in specific areas, and that could then help us target those funds towards specific projects and Say, for example, if we've, we've got an affordable housing project coming in at one location and we know that there's a demand there, we can uh, pitch that to the, the developer, even a private developer, and, and say, hey, uh, look, we can help subsidize the child care portion of this um, if you incorporate it into your design. And so... I think um, to the extent we are able to engage with those applicants early, we stand a better chance at getting that. And, and the child care impact fee is just one way that um, it uh, can sort of sweeten the pot and encourage those developers to take that route. Great. Yeah, no, that, it's good to know that there's a somewhat of a dedicated funding stream and then whatever is available, you know, at the state to secure would be great. And I the only reason I ask is because one thing that's coming up a lot in Santa Cruz City Schools is there's been talk of like this 20 to 30 percent drop in enrollment over the you know next 10 years. But then some sort of assessment was made and people are like, well, wait a minute, actually, we're adding, you know, 3,800 housing units that may really seriously impact right the number of kids that are just in Santa Cruz that need those types of services. So just trying to think super far ahead on that. And it's good to know that, you know, that outreach is being thought about as plans are being developed on specific projects. So thank you. All right, everyone good? I'll now open the public hearing in case anyone wants to come say anything. Seeing nobody will move along. Um, I'm ready to hear a motion on this uh, if somebody's ready to offer one. Commissioner Dawson. Yeah. Um Tess, could you bring up that language I sent you, please? Um, I'd like to move to recommend that the City Council adopt the 2023-2031 six-cycle housing element <clears throat> and associated updates to the safety element of the general plan and staff recommended findings with the um, following proposed language changes. I think it's going to be, oh, I guess we could see them there. Um, so uh, this is, you know, as everybody said, this is a lot of work. There's a lot in there. So instead of, um, I thought that maybe the best way to kind of go through these things would be to um, just put up this language and attach it to the motion and see what we can do with it. Um, a couple of these are just kind of cleanup clarification. A couple of them are substantive. So we can go through them one at a time. Um, I, I just want to say that um, I did quite a bit of research and looking what other um, jurisdictions do related to the state requirement to um, for it's a state law that requires us to replace affordable units right like that's a that's a law that exists um, it's up to the jurisdiction how they want to proceed with that in relation to the inclusionary requirement and there are several jurisdictions um, San Francisco is one of them. I poached the language from them mostly. Wait, hold on. If yeah. we made comments at this point, wouldn't it have to go back out for public comment and back? Or is that the process? No, I, can put a, in? I can put a motion on the floor and then see what people want to do. Right? I mean, we, could we just talk about it? Yeah, that, I mean. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying uh, to cut you off. I'm just not. No, sure I'm just impact. trying to lay out my. And, and then I have to see if I can get a second, right? <laughs> well, I want to talk. I'd be really interested in talking about them one by one anyway. So. Yeah. Well, we can split them out. We can okay. do whatever we'd like. I'm really interested in them. They look really good. Okay. So, tell um, me about the first one. Yeah, so that, that was my logic on the first one. It's up to the municipality how they want to deal with that requirement. Uh, the second one is just. I, I'm, I'm, it's, they're really good, but they're just so fast. I'm trying to. Okay. So, in addition to compliance with the inclusionary requirements yes. set forth in the municipal code, I, I'm, I'm not sure how does this change. Just real quick example would be, um, and let's just ignore whether this math would actually work out. But if I had a 50 unit development that I wanted to tear down and make a hundred unit development. I know there's all, let's just uh, go with this thought experiment. <laughs> and uh, in that 50 unit development, there were four affordable units that were confirmed and staff jump in if I go off track here. And I want to make that a uh, hundred units in the future. Um, instead of providing 20 
units for 20%, you would, I would need to provide 24 units because you, I would. You just, I, I get it. I didn't yeah. get it when I was looking at it backwards and upside down. Yeah. So what you're saying is that you want to take the replacement units that are confirmed affordable yep. and those are already there yeah. and the inclusionary units are on top of that. Absolutely. It. It's, it's about preservation. We kind of were talking about that a little bit. Okay. Uh, the other one's just kind of a little bit of clarification and just throwing out something we've all talked about a lot, um, as, such as a navigation center. It doesn't commit us to that. It just brings it up as a possibility. Um, the next one is holding the university accountable. Um, we've all had many, many discussions about this enrollment level. Um, and then the last one, again, is just a little bit of clarification in language. So I will just stop there and see what folks want to do with this. They want to split it out, they want to second it, they want to have more discussion. Well, I have one comment on, so I think these are great. I do think that the, I mean, the, it's just a bugaboo with student housing. You know, it's always been so frustrating. And I know I've been wrestling with this one for a long time. And the explanation is always, the reason that you don't count student housing in dormitories is that it's not their permanent residence. Right, it's that, so the town is impacted because students have to be somewhere, um, and but dormitory housing doesn't count as housing, so it's just sort of a conf conflict of purposes. And so I agree with the intent. I don't know that I agree with including it in here. I wonder if it gets us anything. I think it just speaks to what the staff said about moving, removing non-committal language. It's just basically, um, in, what is like insist that yeah. the university provide. I mean, what are our levers? In, I mean, I'm not well, sure how to. I'm, I mean, that's a whole other meeting, right? I mean, we've had. I'm, I'm talking about the language, really. I'm talking about to, so. Well, I think it's just trying to put a little bit more. Uh, I agree with you, Julie, that it, it's not really teeth per se, but we all, a lot of us know the history of the potential legal actions around this and the ongoing discussions. So, I mean, again, that's probably a whole other meeting about how we would do that, but um, no, it's and there. I, I wasn't trying to bring up the how we would, I was trying to look for some language that would be useful to do it. Did you have a comment? I have a question mm -hmm. that relates Pete's question, because I feel like then it leads into something else, which is, if we change this language, what does that mean for us meeting the deadlines specifically? I just, I, as we're discussing this, I want to know, and then I have another question after. Depending on how it goes. Thanks for that question. Um, so... In all likelihood, any substantive comment, any substantive changes would need to be recirculated. Um, uh, Non-substantive changes um, would not necessarily need to be recirculated. I mean, we, we can make um, uh, edits. Um, and um, there are alternative approaches to this, however, um, so if there were a substantive change that the planning commission wanted and that the uh, city council ultimately wanted. Uh, there could be, for example, a certification of the document with direction to come back and um, uh, make amendments or refine language um, at a future date. So, so there could be a way in which we um, potentially, yeah, I mean, it, it would be, kind of a, a multi-step process. Um, that's how I would see the options playing out. I, I'll turn to Matt or to Inez to see if uh, you have alternative thoughts on that, or if, would you agree with that approach? Yeah, I would, I would agree. Well, I think that the only one that's potentially substantial is um, the first one, and that's really, that's, that it's really belongs in 24.16. Um, is, is that the appropriate place to address that? Is it the housing element? 
I can't, and I'm trying to remember the language. You probably just recently read 24.16 because I haven't looked at it for a little while. So 24.16 has um, our inclusionary requirements, our density bonus requirements, mm -hmm. um, our replacement housing requirements. We have, we have replacement housing requirements um, in addition to the state. In some instances, we are more strict. In other instances, the state is more strict. And so we have recently added, um, within the last couple of years, clarification that whichever one is more strict, the state or the city, that shall be applied. Um, and, and so that chapter has all of that. I think, um, I think you're right in terms of um, the substantive nature. That one is the most substantive. You know, are arguably, you know, the, the third one doesn't change the intent there either. But um, there is a, a substantive um, a change as part of the first one, and I, I think um, that bears additional discussion. Um, and uh, I think we would have some feedback on that as well if if the commission is interested in uh, contemplating um, making that recommendation to council. So I mean, I'd like to support Commissioner Dawson. I think. Two of these four are good things that I could support. I wonder if we want to split them out a little bit. And if it's not going to like trigger a whole blowing of the timeline and dropping us out of the, the vanguard of 30 jurisdictions, let's improve yeah, this if people I mean, want to. Right. I mean, I feel the same way. That's kind of why I, there are the consequences of not doing this or potential consequences of not meeting those deadlines is concerning. <laughs> And yet, really I do concerning. think that these are valuable. Um, and so if there's a way for us to have both, you know, I do think I agree that these are um, worthy additions or adjustments. I mean, particularly number one is of interest. Um, so, but I'm looking to, I think I'd be looking to you to continue to help us understand what those implications are. So let me ask one more question. I see you guys both. Uh, this is the first time we've seen him. Like, again, I support good new ideas, a few of which are here, but I, I just have concerns about, like, legal and inadvertently making a CEQA thing. Is that is that just my reaction? Because when I read something the first time, I'm always like, ah, you know, it takes a little while to settle in. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, should Especially we be having the, the city of the attorney process. or other experts reviewing this before we just adopt the recommendations to council? I don't see any CEQA implications for the four policies up here. Um, there are some potential legal implications for the first one. Mm -hmm. And so um, if the commission is, is interested in discussing those, we can, we can talk through those. Yeah, I guess I don't feel like the first one um, belongs at this stage of um, this policy document. Um, but I would sure be interested in seeing it um, the next time, um, you know, where that portion of the ordinance comes up. Um, I know we have talked about it in the past, but I'm uncomfortable with this being brought up um, at this stage. Even in April, we would have had a chance to, to um, wrap our arms around it a little bit. Um, that's how I feel about the first one anyway, because I feel like that is the one that could potentially mess up our timeline. Um, you know, the navigation centers are already being discussed, and as a clarification, I sure don't have any problem with that. Everyone wants those. And I think that ended up in the master yeah. plan, by my memory, didn't it? Yeah, and that's all yeah. that's already in yeah, place. I mean, and just kind of elevating yeah, yeah, like it. something. Right. Good. And it's, you know, the fourth one is just tinkering with, you know, based on the timeline of that really important program. Um, and I don't have any problem with that language, and I don't think it has an impact. Um, I'm wrestling with the university one because <laughs> Me too. it's just it's hard to find language that um, you know that 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 is meeting some kind of a goal for us um, and that isn't um, I mean if, if if it is just kind of null language and uh, you know fanning the flame of how you know we're pissed off that they don't produce enough housing and we think the state is wrong in how they make us count housing and um, because I think those things are true. Um, and then I, and if, if, if that's the case, if, it, if some language in there 
could make that case better without screwing up the timeline, then I'd be in favor of trying to find a different word, I think. Um, I, I would agree. It, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, um, I completely agree with the intent mm -hmm. of all of these. Um, I this may be a silly question, but um, I am not familiar with the moving to work program. Do you guys have any information on that? A thirty second blurb on exactly what that is. We'll call Jessica to it back. Okay. Up. And you caught her mid gulp too. That's impressive. <laughs> So the Move to Work program is of only a handful of uh, housing authorities have been able to be successful at getting the designation, so it's, it's a pretty big deal. Um, what it provides the housing authority is access to uh, more vouchers, um, more capacity to create more vouchers. And when, when I mean vouchers, there's you know tenant-based vouchers or project-based vouchers. Tell me if you're tell me if you want me to define those for you, um, but for rental assistance essentially. Um, in addition, they have access to more funding resources, and they have more greater flexibility on how those funding sources are used. So it is like. You know, we're we're excited. Um, so, yeah, is that enough for a thirty first thirty second blurb? <laughs> Sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I I guess my other comment would be that the word insist. Um, if we're going to include something like this, we should probably clarify that because it's difficult to measure that. I had that same. we've insisted, you know, how to, how, it's not a quantifiable situation. I mean, unless you're counting how many times you insist, right? Or, could we, yeah, could we might need to clarify that a little bit, um, but I'm on board with that. Continue personally. to put pressure on. I mean, we've been insisting since I mean, 1975, <laughs> since I, you know, it hasn't you can worked. Ramp it up and say demand. <laughs> that doesn't really mean anything either. I, right. But there's no, I mean, um, I don't know um, what word means anything in this context. I mean, it's already, it, it's, al it's already an objective. Hope. Um, <laughs> um, I would just, I guess the issue that I have with that language in particular is that it elicits, um, and maybe it's a personality thing because I read what what's there, um, you know, originally, and it does sound collaborative. It's an objective that has always been a struggle, and I think that we're always looking for ways to get things done more collaboratively than insisting, and it hasn't worked as we've seen so. I do feel like we've been moving towards a more collaborative effort with UCSC and, you know, by putting more aggressive language that might be not helping our cause when we know that we can't actually insist or really demand as far as I can tell. Otherwise, we would have... Yeah, I guess I'm out. not crazy about the language. I agree with you. I, it makes me feel like we're kind of kicking a little bit of a well. I mean, which is true. We do we do have tantrums about it all all the time, but um, and encourage the university to. I mean, we already have that collaborate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, okay. I don't know. I mean, if it, there's a way that we can insist, and it's actually real. Well, then, part of the problem maybe, is yeah. the way it, it's not just, you know, we've got branches of the state, you know, we've got HCD versus, you know, the UC Regents and, um, you know, just deciding what counts as housing, you know, that are in conflict in within this document. Um, so that's, I guess that's my main. And the other thing about it is it's an objective, right? right. It, it doesn't require that we necessarily meet it, but we are going about meaningfully trying to limit the number of students that get pushed into an already heavily impacted rental market, right? right? I'm not sure that there is a good way to do this, but... Well, I, I feel like um, we were achieving that with collaborating myself, I guess. <laughs> uh, Lee? I think you could um, get at the intent here. I think um, what I'm hearing concern about is the word insist, and so... Um, 
I, I think you could actually strike that portion and say collaborate with UCSC on ways to increase the supply of student, faculty, and staff housing on the university campus, including the provision of on-campus housing for all students above the enrollment level. You beat of me to it. <laughs> I was like, just take out that first part. <laughs> because tape it in there. Because the uh -huh. I like that it's neither mushy nor the, the no, nineteen I... the nineteen thousand is I think the the number is important to get in there and so and that may just help with the you know le maintain the collaborative intent mm -hmm. still get that little bit of information in there that wasn't there. <laughs> Provision of yeah. Yeah. I still don't like it. It's too late to do this like at 8.30. <laughs> uh -huh. With respect, Cindy, it just feels like there's a lot of legal arrangements and deals and handshakes. So I like it, you know, I feel it, but I can't support it. That one in particular. I sure don't have any problem with the second and the fourth even coming in at this late date because um, I don't think that they do anything that they, I think they just clarify things that they're, they're wordsmithing. Do you agree? I would agree. I, I would say that those are really clarifications um, and um, would not trigger emphasis. A, yeah. yeah, it would not trigger a, um, uh, another public comment period. Well, let's separate those out. Mm -hmm. Maybe. If everybody's comfortable with that, or if the maker of the motion's comfortable. Maybe, well, we haven't, so we, we, have, we haven't seconded. Julie's considering a, a second. Do you right. want to consider, I mean, um, you, could, you could do the whole thing, you could do one, you could do two. You could do well, three. I, I wasn't, just wasn't quite ready to move to the motion stage, but I okay. sure am now. Right. <laughs> At 8.30, let's move it. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, so, do you want to clarify your motion? Uh, well, the same motion's on the table. I think it would be for them to split second. it, right? We, I don't think we had a yeah, second. Yeah, we don't have a second. So that so motion it, so dies for lack looking... of a second. Is there a new motion? Um, you, you can make a motion if you want, Julie, to move those two. Mm. Well, I don't think I would move them. <laughs> Anyone like to make, an, make another motion? Um, sure. I can't make that motion. I'll, sure. I'll make a motion for what I said before <laughs> with the proposed changes <laughs> of... Uh, regarding the Navigation Center and uh, the Moving to Work program and uh, leave it at that. And hopefully we can follow up on the other two at a later date because I don't have the votes. <laughs> Is there a second? A second. Commissioner McKelvey seconds. I have a mild discussion that's more of a speech making at this point, but um, I was at the PTO meeting at Bayview School this morning, thinking a lot about school districts. So I love this report when we see it every round because it slices and dices the city in so many different ways. That's just super fun for me to see like demographically. And I've been thinking a lot about the city council districts, kind of the political building blocks of our city. And so I live in District 3 and I look at these numbers and you know, if I asked five of my neighbors what they thought of this housing plan, they'd say, you're crazy, you're ruining our town, you're building huge skyscrapers, yada, yada, yada. But District 3 only needs to build 372 units. 61 very low, low income, 86 moderate income, 255 above income. And when I think of the kids and like the moms in that classroom and the dads in that classroom, and I think of the impact like 61 very low income units would have on our school, oh, it gets me in the heart. So I just want everyone to keep up this good work and everyone to call their city council person and say, hey, listen, here's our new goal. Let's go build some housing like we did next time. It might not be this much, but every unit, every five that's within a block of a school or three or 12 is huge. So I just wanted to put that touch on it before we vote. 
I want to make a point before we vote, too. And um, first of all, to just thank and congratulate staff. I know what a heavy lift these is. I've, I've, I've written a few of these, and they are so much work. Um, and also, um, I really hope that people in the community who are interested in housing, and there's a lot of people expressing interest in housing these days, there's so much information in here. And um, it explains a lot about why we're doing what's happening in the city. So I had that. But then what I really wanted to say and thank you for is Appendix D, um, which is affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, I was annoyed by this when we first heard it was going to come out because it's so hard to tackle. Um, I think you all did a really good job. I'm really glad to see, I'm convinced, I'm glad, really glad that this new requirement is part of um, state housing elements, not because it's going to um, reverse historic institutionalized um, discrimination that is built into our land use patterns, but it forces every single jurisdiction in the state um, to, to have this in its sights um, and to address it. Um, every cycle, and um, so I'm, I'm really glad to see that. Um, I had one more comment as, uh, as I was reading through this very long section, um, <laughs> um, which is about tenant services. Um, there's um, a bit of a, you know, um, a description of the really sincere efforts that we make, and we have a really terrific housing section doing its best with really not very much money. Um, and. Um, but I, I mean, I appreciate that those tenant services are available, the CRLA contract and others are, are worth calling out. Um, but I also remember days when there really were tenant services. They were funded by, um, you know, CETA, which was a really old federal program before you guys were born. Um, and it really helped with um, housing search, with inf information about available resources and how to get on a waiting list, for instance. Um, it, they, it played a really important role. And there, there was a group working on this, and I think they still are, Santa Cruz Black, and a shout out to them. Um, one of the strategies that they identified is that an easy to access organization that could actually help people understand how to find housing because it's such a labyrinth um, and even you know start really putting organized pressure to get the resources needed for it so I just want to put a shout out for tenant services out there that's all I had to I could go on but I won't all right further comments discussion thank you yeah it's, big, a, lot of, it's a lot of work big report a lot of work so thank you guys all right, then we'll call for a roll call vote, Tess. This is for the amended language, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. two, yeah. For two of them. Um, Commissioner Conway? Hi. Dawson? Hi. Gordon? Hi. McKelvey? Hi. Paul Hamus? Hi. Kennedy? Hi. All right, do we have any informational items tonight? Or you want to do a schedule look ahead? Yep, the schedule looking ahead. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Go was, that a, was that a, a vote just on the language change? Don't we need to? And staff recommendation. No. I think. Oh, okay. don't we need to? It was a staff that was the recommendation. Whole thing? With Thank you. <laughs> the staff. I want to change my vote then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, the vote was unanimous, and it, the staff recommendation plus number two and number four, if they were even revised, I don't remember. But yeah. what we ended up with on the screen. Mm -hmm. I got it all. Uh, it's part of my job to announce that too. So. <laughs> me. Um, good schedule. November 30th yes. is next. Uh, well, uh, actually, one piece of information that I wanted to share in advance of uh, the schedule is uh, yesterday the California Coastal Commission heard our objective standards um, and um, approved that unanimously. Um, so um, the, uh, there are some changes. So we need to bring those changes back to the council. They're not particularly substantive. They're just clarifying some of the procedures as they relate to uh, appeals of uh, coastal permits. So we need to bring that back to the um, council. And then once the council has two readings on that, it goes back to the commission. Um, and then once the commission says, yes, the, this is matching 
our approval, then those objective standards for multifamily housing will take effect in the coastal zone. Um, that, uh, I, I wanna just note, that does not include the rezoning. So there are a few properties in the coastal zone that have mixed use rezonings and we're still working on the land use plan updates related to those. And so um, that will be a, a later stage, but multifamily housing will still um, have those objective standards apply as soon as we get through these processes as a big hurdle. And as you know, that was a big process as well. So I wanted to let you all know that, um, that um, it is one step closer, a big step closer, I will say, to taking effect in the coastal zone, which is exciting. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. The words uh, Coastal Commission unanimously approved, I'm like, I don't know what to do with those words, but it's great. I, I will say it was, uh, I will also say it was unanimously approved on the consent calendar. Not even um, <laughs> So that was, uh, that was uh, great to see. Um, and um, then upcoming, um, as you know, um, uh, we have uh, off schedule, regularly scheduled meeting um, two weeks from today. Um, so uh, that will be the appeal of the 900 High Street project, um, at Peace United Church, um, up uh, right by Westlake Elementary School. And um, then um, I'm going to verify the. Oh, I was going to say, is there a meeting? The first meeting in December? No, the first meeting in December was moved <laughs> to that meeting. Uh, then the it's what will be the first meeting in uh, December will be the 21st. We do have items on that, including um, uh, we have a, a fitness center, um, and we have uh, currently we're looking to have the cruise hotel on that agenda. So um, that would be on the 21st, and there is one more. Give me a moment. So let me say that quorum's gonna be very essential for that meeting, so please communicate with staff and CC me just to you know, make sure we have enough folks here. It's, if we've gotta bring cookies and stuff for Santa, you know, if you're a Christian. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. Thank you, Eric. The local, I was looking for which tab that was on. <laughs> the local hazard mitigation plan um, is also currently scheduled for that. Um, so that, that could push out depending on timing. Um, so uh, yes, please let us know if you are not available. That um, will be an important one and we appreciate you um, always and especially that close to uh, a holiday like that. So that that's uh, all for the updates and um, um, for the December for the uh, November thirtieth meeting, um, because it's like right near Thanksgiving, I'm just wondering when we're going to get the information for that meeting. We anticipate having that Wednesday. ready on Wednesday beforehand. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Tess. you, Tess. <laughs> I'll say that on Tuesday, I went to the city, or I called into the city council. They passed the, the natural gas ban right. plug in the road, um, went through council on first reading. Some good discussion. It was very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yes, second reading will be back um, in two weeks on the 28th. And um, yeah, it's uh, electric preferred. Um, oh, excuse so me. They yep. can. <laughs> can't ban. Electric very strongly preferred. Mm -hmm. Yes. So thanks, Lee. Of course, yep. All right, with that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. 8.30. It's pretty early. Bye, Inez. <laughs>